to MindVine, a mental health podcast for everyone. Since our first episode in 2016, we have been sharing stories of recovery, engaging with experts, and tackling the stigma associated with mental illness. The MindVine podcast is produced by Ontario Shores Centre for Mental Health Sciences and is available on YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. Welcome to the Mind Vine Podcast. I'm your host, Daryl Mathers, and we have a very special edition of the podcast today. While we're going to touch on components of mental health for sure, we're here to celebrate and recognize uh, International Women's Day, and we have a very special guest from the Canadian Women's Foundation, Suzanne Duncan. Welcome. Thank you you very much for, for being here as we have this discussion that we've had now um, a number of years on the podcast, but obviously in our community and society, these conversations are are taking place. I'm sure we want to talk about them more than just one day on March 8th every year, but we'll get to that. Uh, I was hoping at first you could start off by just talking about uh, the Canadian Women's Foundation, what you guys are all about. That's great. Thank you so much for having me here, Daryl. And you're right. This is a topic we could talk about 365 days a year. Um, But we're really delighted that so many people bring focus to equity, equality, and gender justice as we approach International Women's Day. So um, as you mentioned, I'm the Vice President at uh, the uh, Vice President of Philanthropy at the Canadian Women's Foundation, which means I have the wonderful job of talking with supporters, with um, corporations, with the public about the kinds of work that the Canadian Women's Foundation does. And we were formed about 35 years ago um, by a group of women who came together and really recognized that even though women uh, and women and gender diverse people make up more than half of the population, often resources are not targeted to issues that are really impacting women. And that could be pay equity, that could be economic development, that could be violence. These are issues that are often treated um, as a second thought. But uh, are really often the first thought um, that women and gender diverse people have. And so this organization came together about 35 years ago with a mandate to get money into grassroots community organizations that were helping women, helping girls, helping gender diverse people move out of poverty out of violence and into confidence and leadership. So we work to raise money from the community and then really get that money into targeted organizations across Canada who are in the grassroots, who are by and for the communities they serve and who are really making a difference for folks who are struggling with income, struggling with violence, struggling with all those key things that hold women and gender diverse people back. And then what's really important is we don't just make sure they get funds, that's important, but what's really important is that we learn because these communities are on the front line of change and they know what's holding people back. They know what it's like to be a newcomer, a racialized person, somebody who might be gender diverse. And what are those structural barriers that are getting in the way? Because it's great to have a solution in the grassroots, but it's equally important to get at the heart of what's continuing to be the problem so that we can take that up to a federal policy level, work with government to rewrite laws, rewrite policy, and really make sure that we're getting at those structural inequalities. So you mentioned the foundation has been around for 35 years and I would guess uh, you've been doing lots of great work in 35 years but probably have gotten a little bit more attention and interest in the last you know three four years Um, you know probably many reasons for that me too the me too movement probably one of those as well Uh, in your work like what have you noticed uh, in terms of change or shifts as the world has kind of paid a a little bit more attention to women's issues. Yeah, that's a great question. And it's definitely something I have noticed. So I've worked with nonprofits for about 20 years. And a lot of those have been women's organizations or mental health organizations. And what's been really interesting is um, we we got to a certain level of progress around pay equity. We got to a certain level of progress around uh, a bit more diversity around leadership and organizations. Um, But some of those gains were unequal. So definitely women who already had a lot of privilege, like white women, like 
middle class folks, uh, people who were born in Canada, um, didn't experience uh, systemic racism, those folks got a lot further ahead, but that was not everybody. And one of our founders, Rosemary Brown, who was the first black um, MP in Canada, has this really great phrase that's been guiding our work, which is, until all of us have made it, none of us have made it. And that's something that really has become even more important in the last couple of years, as we've heard the stories of how women were impacted by the pandemic. And that was definitely disproportionate. Um, and we knew that Black women, Indigenous women, gender diverse people, all were the first people to lose their jobs. They were all the first people to be asked to step up and be heroes um, and to work harder and to do more. And often in the case of uh, like up against some pretty terrible systemic stuff, if we're thinking about PSWs, if we're thinking about nurses, a lot of the folks who would have been part of, um, of that hero piece at Ontario Shores were often the people who had the biggest challenges around childcare, around pay equity, around the way that they were being treated both in the workplace and in, in society at large. Large. And also during the pandemic, um, the, another big push for why we needed to focus on this more was that women really did feel um, pushed out of the workplace. We saw a lot of gender equity gains roll back almost 30 years. So here we are 30 years after being founded, seeing that women's participation in the workforce has been going down, seeing that the, those caregiver burdens, so a lot of things that people took for granted, oh, you know, if I'm in a, a hetero relationship, the, my husband and I are doing the same amount of stuff. As both people were working from home, as both people were having to have the kids at home, that became very clear that that may not actually be the case. And it really led to people speaking up and saying, I'm actually seeing these. I'm feeling these inequalities in ways that I'm surprised to see. Um, these might have been inequalities that um, racialized people or single parents have been feeling for a long time, but we started to see that across all kinds of different groups of women. And they really started to speak up and say, enough is enough. We actually need to make sure we have a, a solid childcare system across the country. We actually need to get at these persistent pay gaps. We need to get at the representation that we see. You know, we... For, for about two years of the pandemic, we were talking about inequalities, we were talking about the, the caregiver burden, and then it very switch, quickly switched into a conversation that was just about economy and wasn't really talking about how people were being impacted on the day-to-day. -day. And I think a lot of people felt left out of that and are continuing to demand from their companies, from their um, workplaces, from their communities, that kind of attention on what is that day-to-day -day like and what sacrifices and inequalities are continuing to be perpetuated that we really need to get to the heart of. And I think uh, I'll just say one other thing as I, as I think about this audience, um, mental health and the conversations around mental health. 10, 15 years ago, we didn't talk about mental health in the workplace. Um, it was very rare. Uh, people didn't really acknowledge the kinds of pressures that, um, you know, depression, anxiety, suicidality, trauma. We didn't really talk about that as having a place in the workplace. Uh, and now we do. Now we do talk about that. We think about the impact of mental health on employees. We think about that as we're going through our, um, our decision making, as we go through our HR supports. And we're opening up as employees employers and as groups to say, it's okay to say when you're not okay. It's okay to speak up. It's okay to um, ask for help and it's okay to demand better. And I think that that mental health conversation where folks were really getting more open about the impacts in their own life has allowed for this next conversation around gender inequality, where people are feeling equally open to have these conversations and you know, there was a time where we thought, you know, suicide's inevitable. And we know that that's not true. And there's a time now where I'm still hearing from people, well, domestic violence is inevitable. It's not true. The more that we can get at these structures, the more that we can demand change, the more that we can demand attention and not have the narrative change, the more that we'll be able to get that long-term change that we're all looking it for. It just makes you think something that's happening recently in, in the media and social media. So... Lisa Flem, a CTV um, broadcaster, um, made headlines um, feeling as though she was pushed out of the workplace, you know, whether it was uh, sexism, ageism, whatever the case may be. Um, certainly on the surface, seems like a, a, a really big women's issue. And in those situations, you have a large audience. Like there are people out there that are outraged. They demand change. 
but that is a big, you know, um, word I'm looking for, but that's a high profile issue, right? And people are quick to latch on to that. I'm sure there are millions of smaller issues, um, or maybe not even smaller issue, but larger issues that don't have as much attention that are that need to have that same kind of aggressiveness, if you will, every day. So how do you balance the kind of those, um, those high profile incidents that are making headlines? And so I would imagine um, they are delivering some of the messages that you want to share to the world while also realizing there are like, there are people out there struggling every day that you're not going to see on social media, that you're not going to see, uh, you know, delivering the news. Mm -hmm. That's a really good example because I do think that that case had a lot of different pieces that, that people attach to differently, whether that's around ageism, whether that's around um, what do corporations owe their employees, whether that is around um, gender pieces. There was a lot happening there. And I think that there's always going to be big headlines that impact women and girls. It makes sense. Like, again, more than half the population, there's going to be big headlines. And I always applaud when we pay attention to stories because that helps people start to make the connections in their own life. Uh, and I think that, yes, absolutely. She is not the first woman who got fired for being a woman. She is not the first woman who got fired for aging. Um, that happens all over the place all the time. But sometimes you need those high profile examples for people to have a light bulb moment. And one thing that I think about a lot right now is gender based violence, because that is a thing that's really out of control in Canada right now. The pandemic spiked gender based violence in ways that are quite upsetting. Um, it spiked both the amount of gender based violence that's happening and also spiked the severity. And this is one of those things where people are going to, you know, that's a topic that's really stigmatized. And that's a topic that's like, well, it's between a couple or the police should deal with it or something like that. But we started to see the Canadian Women's Foundation um, invented a hand sign at the beginning of the pandemic where you can make a, a sign with your thumb to your palm and your fingers going over it so that you could ask for help on a video call without leaving a digital trace. And the idea behind that was that we knew a lot of um, a lot of folks were going to be locked in with their abuser. And most abuse involves also cyber stalking. So people putting keyboard um, monitoring devices in, watching what's happening on what you're doing, tracking your cars, all that kind of stuff. So we needed something that wouldn't leave a trace. And then uh, fast forward about a year and we see this really high profile incident of a young woman in the U.S. using this hand sign out of a car window after she'd been abducted. And that became an enormous story. Uh, I think we, we had the most media coverage of a gender-based violence incident ever. Uh, we talked to 4 billion people over 24 hours. You know, uh, we were on television all around the world. And like, that's one little story. And that, that woman was found safe and the police were able to intervene, all that sort of stuff. But what it actually opened up was a conversation about like, wow, I guess this is going on. I guess this is all over the place. Like I'm hearing about it on the news. I'm now seeing once you hear something once you start to see the other stories that are coming up and what it actually led to was us being able to start something called the signal for help responder campaign which was less about like do you know the hand sign and more about what do you do if you see it what do you do if you're worried what can I do differently instead of just thinking the police are going to take care of this after I learned the facts a little bit more what could I do differently as a sister as a friend as a colleague to be able to be a safe place for somebody to talk to about this. And so we launched this responder campaign, which was really basically like, learn a little bit more. Here's a series of emails. Here's a course. And um, when we launched that, we've actually had 45,000 people across Canada sign up. And that's a huge number for a sort of public awareness, public health piece. Uh, we soft launched a mini course that people can take if they want to support somebody in their life that they suspect is living through violence or abuse. We launched that in December without any kind of promotion. We've already had a thousand people finish the course. And we're going to be launching that on International Women's Day in a much louder way but it's those moments where you see something on TV that resonates with you. You hear something in the news that resonates with you. It allows you to go a little bit deeper and it allows you to, to think through, how do these things affect me? I may not have drawn the lines or the same dots that, that this story is, but there are things I can do in my own life that will help me advance gender equality and gender justice. It, when you speak about gender-based violence, uh, maybe in, in larger terms, but on Ontario Shores, we have 1,300 employees. Uh, 
more than half of them are women. Um, their mm -hmm. representation of the world, right? If you, if there is uh, uh, violence uh, going on in the world, uh, it's going on in smaller communities uh, in a proportionate level. So, you know, when it comes to keeping our, our friends, our colleagues safe and being supportive, what are some of the things that we should be watching for? What are the things, the things we should be doing to, to help the people that we, that we work with, that we love um, stay safe? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the most important thing to think about in, and it transfers so well to mental health workers, um, is non-judgmental listening, really putting your own worries and concerns aside to really focus on the person who's coming to you, really focus in on what they're asking for, what makes sense for them. We go into a lot of these conversations with assumptions, things we've seen on TV, things we've seen in the movies, um, and often those things aren't always the most helpful. So one thing that's really important for folks to know is that if you suspect somebody's living with gender-based violence, your first instinct shouldn't be call 911. Your first instinct should be checking in on somebody and asking them what they need. One thing that we've learned around um, police involvement is that often when police get involved, the, the um, risk of death goes up for the woman. So it's really important for us to be thoughtful about the actions we take, the like, let me just go in there and fix it. I got the solution here. We really need to follow the lead of the person who's in that situation and not judge them when they make decisions that we wouldn't make. Um, I, you know, there was somebody that I was supporting through the pandemic who was living in a dangerous situation. And I kept thinking, like, why doesn't she just leave? Because she wasn't making enough money to be able to rent her own place. So, you know, she was choosing between a dangerous situation and homelessness. And that's a really rough spot that a lot of folks find themselves in because of our high cost of living in a lot of places across Canada. So we need to be really like thoughtful, aware, non-judgmental, open, and be a person that's just checking in on somebody. Be a person that's there in their life that they know they can reach out to if they need help and not be as action oriented as perhaps um, our first instinct is. And we do, and Daryl, I can share with you our single responder, our signal responder uh, website that folks can go to uh, to learn a little bit more. Um, and I think that your your staff team being involved in mental health really puts them ahead of the curve as they think about you know, motivational interviewing and all kinds of different skills that your team would have. Uh, those are very transferable to, to this. I think the biggest part of it is to not make somebody feel even more alone because they're really already in a space where they feel pretty stigmatized and alone and shameful. So how do we interrupt that and give them those supports they need? It, you're, as you're kind of walking us through that, it's a, it's about giving that person a voice, uh, which can be applied in you know numerous situations in life. And what, one of the things we've seen over the last few years as it relates to International Women's Day is the celebration of um, women leaders. And Mm -hmm. uh, and like as a as a man looking at the at this at the issues, it seems to me that that women don't gravitate towards leadership positions as much as men do. But that might be just my interpretation. Um, it's there's probably a line to be drawn towards between that and opportunity. And I think what we've really seen, whether it's um, discussions like this one, or there's events happening all across uh, Canada this week where women are uh, the center of attention. Um, they are uh, in a leadership position. Uh, they're sharing their knowledge. Um, as it relates to March 8th, what type of impact? Well, I know you'd like 360 plus days of talking about women's issues, but what kind of impact does um, March 8th have on you know, the work you're trying to do and the, the work of uh, organizations like yours trying to, to push women's issues forward. Mm -hmm. Well, certainly there are real barriers to women being in leadership. We've seen that play out statistically where um, as soon as folks start to hit that middle management, the pipeline becomes very leaky. And a lot of women leave because they are feeling like they're not being heard. They're not being given the flexibility that they need if they're caregivers. Um, we have more um, CEOs in Canada named Mark than we do women. Um, so there are, you know, there's, there's lots of like fun or, or amusing ways to get at it, but there's some really persistent issues. And a lot of them sort of point to, well, there's no one with enough experience in the pipeline, which 
often isn't true, but it's also part of the pipeline. So we need to be working at every level to make sure that women are being hired and retained because there's really great learning there. But I also have to say that it's not just about putting women in seats in leadership positions. As a, as, a, as a feminist and as somebody who works at an intersectional feminist organization, it's also important that those leaders are continuing to push equity and inclusion forward. It's not enough to say, well, she's a woman, therefore we're fixed. Every woman is different. You wouldn't say he's a man, therefore we're fixed, right? Every woman is different. Every woman's bringing in their own skill sets, their own opportunities their own ideas. And it's important for them to not just rest on the idea that they're a woman, therefore it's fine, but to really explore a little bit more about what are the systemic things? Are there things I could be doing differently as a leader, both as a male or a female leader? What could I be doing differently that adds to inclusion, that reminds myself that it's not just my own experience that matters, it's how other people's experiences fit together. So how can we be um, making sure that we're not just saying, well, as long as there's a woman on the board, then it's fine. But what are we doing as an organization to make sure that there's a wide variety of people from different perspectives, different organ or different perspectives, different lived experiences, folks with disabilities, folks who are racialized, folks who are new to Canada, so that we're really not just seeing the same faces show up over and over again, but we've got a real sense of inclusion that brings all of those great skills and competencies because there's more than enough research research that shows the more varieties of perspectives, the more varieties of experiences that you're bringing to any leadership team, the stronger your business is going to be and the more you're going to be able to really watch for those blind spots that can really hurt productivity, that can really hurt um, corporate bottom lines. What can men or any gender do? Like we talk, you know, we we have the name, you know, women attached to International Women's Day, and a lot of the times the events are, you know, women-led, uh, women celebrated. But there's got to be a role um, for men and all genders to play in advocating for these issues. Absolutely, I think you know. Again. There's so many women and there's so many different issues that impact all of us that have to do with gender equality. So I think it's about folks really thinking about their own lives, their own experiences, and where are they seeing things show up? So if you're a parent, if you're a dad um, who's involved in hockey, think about like what's going on with the coaches, what's going on in those spaces? How can I make sure that there's room for lots of different um, voices and spaces in this place? Um, ask, you know, talk to your daughters, talk to your sisters, talk to your friends about what are the things that are getting in their way and how you can help with that. Um, if you're somebody who has people that you manage in your organization, same sort of things, asking what we could be doing differently, listening when people are suggesting new ideas, understanding what the why is underneath those pieces, and really bringing that same level of curiosity and respect and, um, and, uh, and in intention to everyone that you're managing managing not just women, not just one thing, but really bringing that intentionality into it. And I think there's also huge roles we can all play around things that matter to us, whether that's gender-based violence, whether that's pay gap, whether that's women's safety, walking at night, all those kinds of things. Find the thing that resonates most for you. See who's doing some good work on that and put your hand up to say something about it or learn more about it or speak up in your own communities about those things. Change happens much like mental health and the change that's really happened in the mental health space over the last decade or so. Those things happen because we listen. We listen to the people that are affected. We make new solutions and we're not afraid to talk about it. And I think those same things apply to gender justice and gender equality, not being afraid to speak up when you hear people sort of perpetuating things that are not correct. You, you just drew the parallels, you know, between uh, women's issues and, and mental health. And in our world, we would say uh, there's been significant impact and difference made in terms of um, eliminating the stigma associated with mental health, that it's... Um, you know, it's socially acceptable to have depression or anxiety, um, mm -hmm. as long as it's mild. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> if it gets yeah. more severe, as more complex <laughs> mental illness becomes, it is still heavily stigmatized. And in a lot of ways, um, 
representative of the dark ages I mean, we're not that we, yeah. you know, we're really not that far away that's that's what we would say so you know from yeah. a women's issues perspective you know you talk about some of the inroads you've made i'm guessing there is another parallel there that um there is still some significant work to be done Absolutely. I would, um, I spent a lot of time working in mental health. So this is a parallel I like to make all the time. Um, I would say that the anxiety and depression side of it is pay equity and absolutely pay equity is super important. And it's really, really important for racialized people who are often at even more multipliers of disadvantage around pay equity, but pay equity and, and like leadership are some of the easiest topics to talk around, around, um, around women's issues. Childcare is another one where people are like, yeah, that seems, that seems fair. That seems easy. When we start to get into gender-based violence, when we start to get into, um, into sexual assault, when we start to get into those conversations, conversations, that's often when I feel people pull back. Um, and I would say that the that the conversations around sexual assault are in that same stigmatized place that conversations around like um, suicidality, conversations around really serious mental health issues, there's sort of, there's a bit of a parallel there. And I'm not making any kind of um, relationship between those two things other than there's definitely things that people see show up in their lives, um, more people see show up in their lives and feel comfortable talking about and other things that have been so stigmatized for so long and have very poor social responses. You know, to have sexual violence have really the only response we have around sexual violence is police intervention. And that rarely works and rarely do the courts actually perform when it comes to sexual assault. So there's definitely spaces where the system is just not built for the problem. And those are things we need to really, really get underneath. And fortunately, Canada has just put together a national action plan on gender-based violence that has some really clear recommendations. But unless we all say enough is enough, unless we all say invest better, unless we all say enough of stigmatized issues, let's really get at some of these persistent things we need to have that same kind of groundswell around that and around those really persistent issues that we've seen make things like anxiety and depression or pay equity more tolerable as topics. Well, thank you very much for bringing these topics and issues uh, to light with having this conversation. Uh, and hopefully it's March 8th is not just one day that we have these conversations and that some of the things you mentioned today, hopefully, People will see them as tools uh, to bring to the workplace, to bring to their personal lives, uh, their families, wherever it's appropriate. So thank you very much for joining us. Really appreciate it. My pleasure, Daryl. Thank you so much for having me. Make sure to like and subscribe and turn on post notifications. Thank you for watching Mind Vine Podcast.